The Lightning Thief, Chapter 11 We Visit the Garden Gnome Emporium In a way, it's nice to know there are Greek gods out there, because you have somebody to blame when things go wrong. For instance, when you're walking from a bus that's just been attacked by monster hags and blown up by lightning, and it's raining on top of everything else, most people might think it's just really bad luck. When you're a half-blood, you understand that some divine force really is trying to mess up your day. So there we were, Annabeth and Grover and I, walking through the woods along the New Jersey riverbank, the glow of New York City making the night sky yellow behind us, and the smell of the Hudson reeking in our noses. Grover was shivering and braying, his big goat eyes turned slit-pupiled and full of terror. Three kindly ones! All three at once! I was pretty much in shock myself. The explosion of bus windows still rang in my ears, but Annabeth kept pulling us along, saying, Come on! The further away we get, the better! All our money was back there, I reminded her. Our food and clothes, everything. Well, maybe if you hadn't decided to jump into the fight. What did you want me to do? Let you get killed? You didn't need to protect me, Percy. I would have been fine. Sliced like sandwich bread, Grover put in, but fine. Shut up, goat boy, said Annabeth. Grover brayed mournfully. Ten cans, a perfectly good bag of ten cans. We sloshed across mushy ground through nasty, twisted trees that smelled like sour laundry. After a few minutes, Annabeth fell into line next to me. Look, I, her voice faltered. I appreciate you coming back for us, okay? That was really brave. We're a team, right? She was silent for a few more steps. It's just that if you died, aside from the fact that it would have really sucked for you, it would mean the quest was over. This may be our only chance to see the real world. The thunderstorm had finally let up. The city glow faded behind us, leaving us in almost total darkness. I couldn't see anything of Annabeth except a glint of her blonde hair. You haven't left Camp Half-Blood since you were seven? I asked her. No, only short field trips. My dad, the history professor? Yeah, it didn't work out for me living at home. I mean, Camp Half-Blood is my home. She was rushing her words out now as if she were afraid somebody might try to stop her. At camp, you train and train, and that's all cool and everything. But the real world is where the monsters are. That's where you learn whether you're any good or not. If I didn't know better, I could have sworn I heard doubt in her voice. You're pretty good with that knife, I said. You think so? Anybody who can piggyback ride a fury is okay by me. I couldn't really see, but I thought she might have smiled. You know, she said, maybe I should tell you something funny back on the bus. Whatever she wanted to say was interrupted by a shrill toot, 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 like the sound of an owl being tortured. Hey, my reed pipes still work, Grover cried. If I could just remember a fine path song, we could get out of these woods. He huffed out a few notes, but the tune still sounded suspiciously like Hilary Duff. Instead of finding a path, I immediately slammed into a tree and got a nice size knot on my head. Add to the list of superpowers I do not have, infrared vision. After tripping and cursing and generally feeling miserable for another mile or so, I started to see light up ahead, the colors of a neon sign. I could smell food, fried, greasy, excellent food. I realized I hadn't eaten anything unhealthy since I'd arrived at Half-Blood Hill, where we lived on grapes, bread, cheese, an extra lean-cut, nymph-prepared barbecue. This boy needed a double cheeseburger. 
I kept walking until I saw a deserted two-lane road through the trees. On the other side was a closed-down gas station, a tattered billboard for a 1990s movie, and one open business, which was the source of the neon light and the good smell. It wasn't a fast food restaurant like I'd hoped. It was one of those weird roadside curio shops that sell lawn flamingos and wooden Indians, cement grizzly bears, and stuff like that. The main building was long, low warehouse surrounded by acres of statuary. The neon sign above the gate was impossible for me to read because if there's anything worse for my dyslexia than regular English, it's red cursive neon English. To me, it looked like Antiumes Gerden Gomden Mepromium. What the heck does that say? I asked. I don't know, Annabeth said. She loved reading so much I'd forgotten she was dyslexic too. Grover translated. Antiumes Garden Gnome Emporium. Flanking the entrance, as advertised, were two cement garden gnomes. Ugly, bearded little runts, smiling and waving as if they were about to get their picture taken. I crossed the street following the smell of the hamburger. Hey, Grover warned. The lights are on inside, Annabeth said. Maybe it's open. Snack bar, I said wistfully. Snack bar, she agreed. Are you too crazy, Grover said. This place is weird. We ignored him. The front lot was a forest of statues, cement animals, cement children, even a cement satyr playing the pipes, which gave Grover the creeps. Blah, he bleated. Looks like my Uncle Ferdinand. We stopped at the warehouse door. Don't knock, Grover pleaded. I smell monsters. Your nose is clogged up from the furies, Annabeth told him. All I smell is burgers. Aren't you hungry? Me? He said scornfully, I'm a vegetarian. You eat cheese enchiladas and aluminum cans, I reminded him. Those are vegetables. Come on, let's leave. These statues are looking at me. When the door creaked open and standing in front of us was a tall Middle Eastern woman. At least I assumed she was Middle Eastern because she wore a long black gown that covered everything but her hands and her head was completely veiled. Her eyes glinted behind a curtain of black gauze. That was about all I could make out. Her coffee-colored hands looked old, but well-manicured and elegant, so I imagined she was a grandmother who had once been a beautiful lady. Her accent sounded vaguely Middle Eastern, too. She said, Children, it is too late to be out all alone. Where are your parents? They're, um, Annabeth started to say, we're orphans, I said. Orphans, the woman said. The word sounded alien in her mouth. But my dears, surely not. We got separated from our caravan, I said. Our circus caravan. The ringmaster told us to meet him at the gas station if we got lost. But he may have forgotten, or maybe he meant a different gas station. Anyway, we're lost. Is that food I smell? Oh, my dears, the woman said. You must come in. Poor children. I am Auntie M. Go straight through to the back of the warehouse, please. There is a dining area. We thanked her and went inside. Annabeth muttered to me, Circus caravan? Always have a strategy, right? Your head is full of kelp. The warehouse was filled with more statues people in all different poses, wearing all different outfits and with different expressions on their faces. I was thinking you'd have to have a pretty huge garden to fit even one of these statues because they were all life-size, but mostly I was thinking about food. Go ahead, call me an idiot for walking into a strange lady's shop like that just because I was hungry, but I do impulsive stuff sometimes. Plus, You've never smelled Auntie M's burgers. The aroma was like laughing gas in the dentist's chair. It made everything else go away. I barely noticed Grover's nervous whimpers or the way the statue's eyes seemed to follow me or the fact that Auntie M had locked the door behind us. 
All I cared about was finding the dining area. And sure enough, there it was at the back of the warehouse, a fast food counter with a grill, a soda fountain, a pretzel heater, and nacho cheese dispenser. Everything you could want, plus a few steel picnic tables out front. Please sit down, Auntie M said. Awesome, I said. Um, Grover said reluctantly. We don't have any money, ma'am. Before I could jab him in the ribs, Auntie M said, No, no, children, no money. This is a special case, yes. It is my treat for such nice orphans. Thank you, ma'am, Annabeth said. Auntie M stiffened as if Annabeth had done something wrong. Then the old woman relaxed just as quickly. So I figured it must have been my imagination. And I think we'll pause there and work on this chapter again tomorrow. Till then, as Tigger says, ta-ta for now. Thanks for watching. I love you guys. Bye-bye.